I think the participants will be joining me shortly. So I think it's already time, exact for one here uh, in Bangkok. So with the permission from uh, the chair of uh, the event as well as Dr. Pal, uh, we will be starting the event. So distinguished speakers, honorable guests, dignitaries, official, officials, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Uh, joining us today in this August Forum from all around the world. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Delta Resilience and Risk Governance Expert Forum, South and Southeast Asia, Converging Policy, Science and Practice for Coherent Actions to Sustain Asian Deltas. The event jointly organized by uh, uh, Disaster Preparedness Mitigation and uh, Sorry, Disaster Preparedness, Mitigation and Management, Asian Institute of Technology, in collaboration with Living Delta's Research Hub, LDH, and uh, Asia Pacific Network for Global, Re uh, Global Change Research. Uh, today, I'm Neshma Tuladar, postgraduate student here at DPMM AID. Very proud and grateful to be here with the amazing audience back again after three consecutive successful series of events. The Delta Resilience and Risk Governance Expert Forum we initially conceptualized uh, to converge and to bring together a single platform where we can bring in policy, science and practice and talk about it further, which will further be highlighted by uh, Dr. Bal in his uh, welcome and brief remarks. I'd not like to highlight much because we've been uh, talking consecutively uh, after in three events and we had like series of events series number one which uh, the expert forum highlighted in a Ganga Brahma Putra Meghna Delta India followed by uh, the Ganga Brahma Putra Meghna um, Delta in Bangladesh followed by uh, Mekong and Red River in Vietnam then we had a series of discussions with series of <clears throat> Uh, distinguished panels and speakers, uh, both from our, the administration, research, as well as government representatives, where we highlighted a series of issues and how we can pave our way forward to sustain the Asian deltas. And today we bring this platform where we talk about the overall perspective from the South and Southeast uh, Asia region. Uh, so that we can contribute coherent actions uh, for sustainable and better futures uh, for the deltas in South and Southeast Asia. So uh, the highlights of all the three events will be uh, shortly addressed by Dr. Bal in his uh, remarks as well. So I'd like to uh, kickstart uh, this expert forum with uh, the permission from Dr. Bal, as well as the chair for today's session, Dr. Sandrish Shrivastava. So please help me in welcoming ladies and gentlemen, uh, Dr. Indrajit Pal, the Associate Professor and Chair of Disaster Preparedness, Mitigation and Management, Asian Institute of Technology. I'd like to in, uh, invite Dr. Pal for his uh, welcome and brief overview of today, uh, today's event, as well as uh, highlighting the three consecutive uh, series of events we had under the Expert Forum. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Nishma, for a long sort of detail for the initiation. So uh, with that, without further delay, like very good afternoon from Thailand. It's cloudy and rainy uh, here today. Uh, welcome to Delta Resilience uh, and the Risk Governance Expert Forum for uh, South and Southeast Asia. Uh, this is the fourth, as Neshma mentioned, and final expert forum of the series. Um, I believe it's a great opportunity to interact with the researcher and practitioners working in this region uh, and also interested to work on the Delta Risk, Resilience and Governance related works. And uh, we know like vulnerability of ecosystem and people to climate change uh, differ sus substantially among and within the region. And it depends on the socioeconomic conditions given by patterns of the intersecting socioeconomic development. And also unsustainable ocean and land use is also initiating that process. And uh, driven by the inequality and marginalization always influences the governance mechanism of the deltas. And it is also well evidenced through various research, uh, like uh, that the vulnerability is higher in the location with uh, poverty, governance challenges, and also limited access to basic services and resources. And most importantly, high level of climate sensitive livelihoods. And this is also one of the uh, sort of key areas where our Delta Resilience Program or the project is working on. The project Living Delta Hub, uh, supported by UK Research and Innovation and Global Challenge uh, Research Fund, UKRI, GCRF in short, is primarily invested in building sustainable Delta futures in South and Southeast Asia. And the project target countries are India, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. And we are targeting like uh, three Deltas, uh, uh, with the various researchers, more than 100 
uh, sort of renowned researchers are with including ECR, early career researchers are also involved in this big project uh, led by uh, Professor Andy Large from Newcastle University. Shortly, he will address us. And uh, we are also thankful to Asia Pacific Network for global uh, challenge research. Uh, um, the director from the APN, short, I mean, in short, is uh, popularly known as APN, uh, to join hand as a co organizer for this event. Um, uh, in line with the aim of the hub, the Delta Resilience and Risk Governance Expert Forum, this is the fourth one, uh, is an initiative for sharing the voices of primary stakeholders. So we're trying to catch hold of like uh, various stakeholders who are in the academia, who are in the research or in the practitioners uh, departments or maybe in the sort of public policy making process and in the decision making administration to deepen the understanding of the environmental and anthropogenic challenges followed by the necessity of the amalgamation of the science and governance and try to reduce the gap and try to make a bridge through these processes and in the end possibly we are, we are coming up with some sort of documentation where we can highlight the the take from all these uh, experts we are we are listening for last uh, four consecutive three and today is our fourth one uh, this forum and that could be published as some sort of uh, document as a white paper or a policy paper uh, for for better understanding for various uh, various uh, stakeholders so on behalf of ait and organizing team i'd like to convey my sincere thanks to all the speakers and uh, panel members especially to accept our request and also spare their valuable time i know everyone is too much busy with the with the global audience and this whole program will be recorded and edited fine fine further and it will be placed in the social media uh, for further uh, sort of uh, understanding with this initial remarks i'd like to welcome all the participants once again thank you so much and uh, i hope it will be beneficial for this global audience thank you and welcome again over to neshma Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pal. So now I'd like to welcome Dr. Sanjay Srivastava, who's currently the Chief of Disaster Risk Reduction at United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific, UNESCAP Bangkok, Thailand, uh, who will be chairing uh, today's session, the Data Resilience and Risk Governance Expert Forum, South and Southeast Asia. Uh, Dr. Srivastava is already here, so over to you, Dr. Srivastava. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Paul, uh, colleagues, uh, Nesma. It's a uh, it's a privilege to be here and uh, uh, here with you, uh, moderating the discussion. So thank you very much for giving this opportunity, and I truly, sincerely appreciate uh, this Delta Resilience and Risk Governance Expert Forum uh, for doing a great job pulling the knowledge, uh, research, science policies together. Uh, on some of the hot spots of the region uh, worldwide, but more particularly in Asia and Pacific regions. So our discussion is uh, going to center around uh, seven themes, which I think uh, uh, two questions and seven themes. Uh, but before coming to that, I would like to bring a few points from uh, uh, the perspective of the United Nations ISCAP, which I am uh, heading disaster risk reduction uh, program. Uh, the transboundary cooperation and collaboration, I am very happy that it's flagged off as one of the discussion themes. Uh, on transboundary collaboration and cooperation with the Delta resilience, it, it, it's uh, one of the areas where uh, I think we we have not made much uh, progress uh, uh, in, in, in particularly from a policy and practices perspective. Long time back, if I like to share with you in the 60s, uh, there was a massive typhoon uh, which led to the uh, birth of what we call ISCAP WMO Typhoon Committee. It's a transboundary cooperation among all the typhoon uh, exposed country of uh, South Pacific uh, countries. Then came to Cyclone Bola in Bangladesh. I think one of the deadliest cyclone the world has ever experienced uh, in the 70s and that led to the uh, tropical cyclone panel, ISCAP and WMO tropical cyclone panel. 
So those were the initiative of transboundary collaboration. Uh, the Delta region of particularly Bay of Bengal were part of it. Uh, so there was a progress particularly as far as the early warning system, joint collaboration among the hydrometeorological, hydrological and disaster risk reduction community of the Delta regions of the Bay of Bengal. Uh, but there are not many ground which needs to be covered and I'm so happy that this uh, forum uh, is going to address many of the unmitigated issues uh, uh, which I am so happy Professor Paul has tied up uh, with the two major questions. How the risk governance placed in deltas to mitigate future risk for climate induced hazards? That's the first major question that could be the guiding questions for the discussion. The second is how is the delta level resilience practiced uh, in the delta and its influence on future pathways. So if we could able to pin down, uh, focus on these two questions and the themes are water politics, which uh, I'm so happy I'm uh, sitting in front of all the practitioners in this area, water politics, climate change and delta future. Climate delta is the hotspot of the climate risk. Then transboundary collaboration, cooperation, risk governance, gender issues, SDG localization. Many countries have now taken forward the localization, whether localization captures delta vulnerability is one of the issues could be discussion. Trade-off between development objectives and delta conservation, ecosystem-based adaptation, delta knowledge production and capacity building. So I think we have discussion themes centered around two guiding questions and it's a, my pleasure to, to invite uh, the experts with opening remark from Professor Andy Large, Director of Living Delta Hubs. Uh, over to you, uh, Professor Andy. It's a, it's a privilege to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Srivastava, uh, for those kind remarks. Um, uh, what I'll do, I'll just take five minutes just to introduce the hub and uh, and thank you again to uh, Neshma, Indradit and the team at AIT for this um, for this uh, seminar series. Extremely very uh, useful, timely and uh, something that we um, really need. I'm just trying to see if I'm sharing my screen. Am I sharing my screen? Nothing yet. Have you got, have you got that? Yes, now we can see. You got the slides yet. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I just want to spend a, a, a few minutes very briefly trying to cover quite a complex um, entity in terms of Living Delta's hub. So I'll, I'll run through this as quickly as I can. And I just want to leave maximum time for the for the very important um, questions that have just been outlined by our distinguished chair. So uh, thank you very much to everybody, as I say, and uh, I'm very honored to be part of this series. Uh, just to highlight that the Living Delta Hub is moving towards a, a further webinar series later on in this year, so um, look out for more on that. Um, as Indrajit says, we're, we're a big entity with over 130 researchers on the hub. We're very proud to have 50% of those early career researchers. I think that's extremely important um, in terms of uh, looking towards the future and trying to establish a legacy from this from this hub for the future and to and to and to lay down the grounds for further collaboration which is extremely important this hub is really only beginning to open up some of the questions i think and we really need to to look at building on this network of um of, of research organizations and partners i haven't outlined our research partners on this slide but it's extremely important that, that we use this as a springboard for carrying on our work I won't dwell on this, Indra Jits already mentioned where, where we're working. We're, we're working in, in four Delta social ecological systems throughout South and Southeast Asia. Uh, the, the GBM Delta between in, India and Bangladesh, emphasizing the need for transboundary management. Uh, and in Vietnam, the Red River Delta and, and the Mekong River Delta. And again, those two deltas are, are, are sort of managed in a sort of individual way. And so there's a need for the, uh, a, a, again, a transboundary approach within that one country. Um, these deltas are about 1500 kilometers apart um, in terms of how we can look to the future for delta sustainability. Our whole hub is, is built around natural cultural heritage. This was um, something that we wanted to incorporate and, and, and 
headline from the start because we believe that locally rooted or indigenous knowledge underpins locally led adaptation and the peoples on the deltas in this region of the world are amongst the currently amongst the world's first global climate change adapters they're having to adapt to climate change now and so as i've just said transboundary sharing of co-created knowledge with practitioners delta communities governments researchers is a key aim of the hub and this delta resilience and risk governments uh, webinar series is very much a part of that process but climate change is often uh, referred to as either the elephant in the room or the root cause of problems but we have to bear in mind that climate change is merely exacerbating a lot of bad practice that's occurring on the deltas of the world and in, in, in elsewhere, we, we humans are, 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 are not good uh, caretakers of our, of our planet. And so population rise, pollution, biodiversity loss are, are amongst the, the, the drivers that are exacerbated by climate change. We've seen that COVID-19, which has affected the hub over the last two years, largely came about through ecosystem simplification. And so there's a range of issues that, that are, are pulled together. And in the hub, we try to do this through a, a range of of work streams which uh, try to raise voices of the deltas, look at behavior and risk, build monitoring where monitoring is not there and to add to monitoring programs which are already in existence, focus in on vulnerable areas such as the coast, the GCRF hubs program of which there are 12 hubs uh, was jointly written by UNDP so the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals are very much part of our program and impact out of that is extremely key in terms of research for change and transformation on the deltas. And during COVID, we, we split our work streams into sort of more nimble, agile working groups of which vulnerability and resilience headed by AIT is one of those we can see in work stream two. Um, but there's so much blurring of the boundaries between these working groups, they work together and crisscross it. It's, 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 a, it's a, a job to keep track of what we're doing in terms of that large entity. And what we're trying to do, as Indrajit said, is to build towards sustainable Delta futures. Each of our work packages and uh, work streams and our, our, our research areas are feeding into um, dealing with either Delta health information, natural and built infrastructural context, good governance, et cetera, et cetera, cetera long-term Delta information. And through that, we aim, we aim to build anticipatory capacity, absorptive or coping capacity, adaptive capacity, and then where we can, drive transformation in practice and, and, and uh, processes on the deltas to enable better sustainable delta futures. And so some of the key questions, there are many, uh, are how are the deltas changing? What are the key drivers and consequences? And, and what are the delta stories that we need to unpick to, to, to help us understand some of these changes? We look to capacity strengthening. We're aiming to reach the most vulnerable and marginalized under the SDG agenda. We're seeking to ensure no one is left behind and we aim at youth and gender and better governance across deltas. As I said, we're trying to raise the voices of delta dwellers. We're looking at equitable partnerships between researchers, communities, governments, practitioners, and partners towards better resilience. And in terms of vulnerability, hazard and risk, the very much uh, the, the very subject of, of this seminar series, in essence, we are really interested and I'm interested today to see how can Delta risk governance mitigate future risks from climate induced hazards. And secondly, as our chair has just mentioned, and how can we raise Delta resilience or optimize it in the deltas? And what is the influence or the dependence of that resilience on, on development pathways which are in in train now and ones which we would like to see in, in the future and I really look forward to, to hearing from this and uh, without further ado I'll pass on to uh, pass back to you Neshma and uh, with every best wish for a really good seminar and thank you very much again for inviting me to to speak at the start thank you uh, thank you so much uh, Professor Andy uh, for uh, the brief remarks, as well as overviewing, uh, putting up the overview for of our work here in LDH. So now I'd like to. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Mr. Yoichi Koyama, who is the director at the Asia Pacific Network for Global Change uh, Research, Japan, 
second at from the Ministry of Environment, a government of Japan. Uh, Mr. Goyama is currently leading the operational management of the APN Secretary and who supports the work of APN. Over to you, Mr. Uh, Goyama. Thank you. Thank you, Nashua san. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Yuji Toyama, director of the Secret of the Asia Pacific Network for Global Change Research, more commonly known as APN. It's my great pleasure to greet and deliver my remarks to the participants here today. The Asia Pacific region is home to more than half of the world's population with many different demands, rich resources, diverse communities, and various cultural heritages. However, the region is challenged by significant impacts of natural and anthropogenic change in our Earth system, including climate change and loss of diversity. As evident in many studies, climate change in induces widespread impacts ranging from sea level rise to the increased number and more intense of typhoons, precipitations, floods, landslides, shifts of ecosystems, etc., which severely affect the safety and well-being of people in this area. The Mekong Delta is one of the focus areas of today's session. This area is located in Monsoon Asia and is well known as a highly fertile region that offers ideal conditions for food production. Canal run like web and boats are the main transportation in this area. The great rice production for exportation in the area leads Vietnam to be the second biggest rice exporter in the world. We can easily imagine many hazards, hazards derived from global environmental change in this vulnerable region, such as increased Increased precipitation, floods, land degradation, and spread of infectious diseases. In order to manage those large hazard risks adequately, it's crucial to investigate the risks from multilateral viewpoints. I imagine that today's event will introduce recently developed risk management methods and tools for such vulnerable delta areas. This will include indicators of measuring level food security and resilience against much hazards, including the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope those efforts clarify the details of risks of the residents and lead to express more robust policies against the risks. We at APN are very proud to support some of these efforts through the APN project associated with Dr. Powell and AIT, including capacity build and promotion of science policy dialogues among stakeholders, which directly contribute to APN's mission. The mission of APN is to address the challenges of global change and sustainability in the Asia Pacific region by supporting scientific research, capacity building, and effective science policy interactions. And as urgent COVID-19 pandemic, we believe it's more important to strengthen our association with like-minded organizations and collaborate with international communities across borders. This will allow us to seek the establishment of a post-pandemic society that is more religious, sustainable, safe, and equitable for everyone more effectively. APN is carrying out its activities along with its fifth strategic plan in which it emphasizes the importance of contribution to the international agenda such as the Paris Agreement, the SDGs, the Center Framework of Disaster Risk Reduction, the Post-2020 Global Diversity Framework, and the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. In our effort to provide policy-relevant scientific outputs, the most recent IPCC 6 assessment report had more than 100 citations from over 60 APN projects, thus contributing successfully to the accumulation of policy relevant science knowledge. All the global issues are interlinked among the environment, economy, and society, and the problems we face 
are becoming more and more complicated. The capacity to consider and analyze those issues from various as aspects and to establish more integrated solutions is desperately needed in many business areas. With this point, ladies and gentlemen, this session will provide an excellent opportunity for you to learn about the challenges in multi hazardous risk management, particularly in the Delta region like Mekong Basin. I wish the organizer, DPMM AIT, a very successful workshop. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, respected speakers. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Toyama. Uh, thank you to Professor Large. Thank you to Professor uh, Mr. Toyama for your time, for taking our time from your busy schedule. I know it's already pretty late in Japan already. But still, we have team from APN as well as LDH. It's early morning uh, there in UK. So we have team from both the sides who have joined uh, today. So thank you very much. Uh, would, I'd like to request um, uh, to please stay back because we are taking a group picture for right now. So I'd like to request all the uh, participants to also please uh, keep your cameras turned on uh, so that we could quickly uh, get a group picture for our final forum event. Thank you. I'd like to request uh, Gani to please take on the responsibility for a quick screenshot. Thank you. Thank you, Nashma. So I'd, I would like to request everyone to please turn off your video. Within the next 30 seconds, we are going for a screenshot. Thank you. With smile or without smile? <laughs> <laughs> it smiles. Okay, uh, on a count of three, all of you need to say cheese with me, okay? Get ready. One, two, three, say cheese. Okay, one more time. One, two, three, say cheese. Okay, thank you everyone, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Gani. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in. So today now we'll be kick, uh, starting the very important uh, session, the first half of uh, today's event after our uh, remarks uh, from the chair as well as our opening remarks from uh, the directors from our two main um, project partners. So now uh, I'd like to uh, request um, our key speakers. We'll be heading for our uh, session uh, from our key speakers. But first, uh, I'd like to request our key speakers to cater to the 15-minute presentation time that has been already circulated. So first of all, uh, I'd like to invite Professor Salimul Haq, who is the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICAD, and also the professor at Independent uh, University of Bangladesh. Uh, I think Professor Haq has already joined in. I'd like to request the team to please just make a check through. Next, it seems the uh, professor hasn't joined it. So if uh, I think Professor Huck will be joining shortly. So I would like to move on with our key speaker, Dr. Hul. Uh, I think Dr. Heng Hul has already joined and I can see him uh, in the screen already. So if Dr. Hul is ready, uh, I think Dr. Hul will be the first one uh, for the, his uh, presentation and remarks. Dr. Hul is uh, serving as the Director General, General Directorate of uh, Science, Technology and Innovation, Ministry of Industry, uh, Science, Technology and Innovation in Cambodia. He's also chairing the National Committee of Science, Technology and Innovation of ASEAN in Cambodia. So over to you, Dr. Hul. Uh, thank you very much uh, for allowing me to share the screen. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, to confirm. Yes, Dr. Okay, thank you. Okay, very good afternoon. I would like to brief on 
what is actually before I moved to the ministry, I was a former vice president of the Institute of Technology and in the Institute of Technology of Cambodia for, for 14 years over there working as a researcher and came to the ministry in the last uh, during the pandemic. But still, my heart is uh, working on research, but now we are focusing mainly on on governance, on perspective, on you know evidence-based uh, policy developments that what we are doing. So let me break uh, what uh, we are doing here is you know uh, you know in Southeast Asia or particularly in Cambodia two important points that we have to take into consideration when we talk about ensuring the sustainability and inclusive development of the data. One is the uh, you know, seasonal, the dynamic hydraulic process, high risk of flooding and drought, you know, if the, 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 the depth or the, you know, the intensity of a drought and flood is, is uh, to be considered in our you know, decision process. Mechanism or process every day, high productivity, by the reset purification also be considered. I think productivity is important. Increasing water demand also for energy and food. Rapid economic growth and risk environmental degradation. And another one, climate change. I think the former speaker have mentioned this already. And the last one is as human resource. It's important for ensuring the sustainability and inclusiveness in the region. I think uh, Cambodia context, uh, when we're talking about the resiliency of the data, I think few stakeholders important, like MORAM, Ministry of uh, Water Resources and Meteorology, uh, Ministry of Environment, NMT National Mekong Commission, MOC, everybody knows the BASAP Authority. I think the BASAP also significantly amount of uh, Mekong uh, reef uh, waters and it affects a lot and not affect it link significantly to the data and Ministry of Industry Science is there and working now we are working on you know data management, data gathering and data collection. All of these are in our mandate and local authority is important there. So I, I go brief on that and expect in terms of uh, discussion later on. Uh, another one is a challenge in terms of water quality, quantity and security. I think uh, data itself link a lot, not only to the water alone, uh, quantity and quantity, but security. So one is uh, development of uh, upper Mekong and lower Mekong. I think it's a long talk and scientifically, non-scientifically, we have to discuss climate change, better understanding, we, we all discuss uh, from time to time, especially uh, among scientists. Data availability, sharing and reliability, cross-cutting issue, I think, uh, even geopolitical issue is there in terms of the upper part and lower part. I think this uh, bring not only to scientists, but also to policy makers to uh, pay seriously attention to this, you know, because long term, it's important that how we ensure Long before we were till uh, the data uh, harmonization, inclusiveness, and proper development, uh, proper conservation or preservation of uh, of some species of the biodiversity is important. And governance, I think, to to my experience working in the sectors and also in the policy development level, I think uh, breaking the silo among among stakeholder from because the uh, transboundary issue like this is not easy we, we do not need to work along among local partner i think i'm working alone in local partner is a headache to me already to explain how much more that we have to work you know across uh, governments and also um, you know lower level and upper parties and so even, even more challenging one strong coordinating body like a more is making but mainly on lower part on uh, lower Mekong and uh, also is what we are doing. More scientific based location is needed, more dialogues is needed, more inclusive approach that we have, we have to keep in mind, we have to agree among all stakeholders from you know the source in Tibet till the data of Mekong leaders. And other issue of course uh, that we may discuss in detail. So case study that we do uh, 
know, per my actual experience in the Mekong River, for example, the upper thing on the top lake, we have a you know, huge amount of water absorbed, and we, it's, uh, you know, it's a river doll uh, flow of uh, this uh, sub lake in the Mekong River. So, this today's sub lake is a light, shallow lake, which is sweet, and it happened, you know, it, it happened that the lake faced uh, some challenges of you know uh, sedimentation and all of this already and of course sedimentation caused the lake or the shallow and shallow cause another issue also to see the data uh, itself uh, and another issue is uh, another point that I would like to share uh, to all of you is uh, the sub lake environment of assets that uh, this lake you see it's a uh, it's a, a, a big lake that you know, serves locally and also uh, you know uh, contribute into both quantity and quality of uh, water in the Kong River, where almost uh, you know a country like Cambodia, uh, Vietnam, uh, Laos, uh, uh, heavily you know, directly and indirectly connected to this lake. So what we do. Uh, what we do in in the lake is, you know, try to collect as much as information about uh, the lake concerning the biodiversity, water quality, uh, hydrologic and hydrodynamic condition of the lake, and pollutants uh, in the lake, and also from our policy perspective and how how we do uh, to manage uh, the lake uh, in in a more inclusive and sustainable way. So it stuck. Okay, so so what we do, I think it, it could be an experience to other stakeholders as well in other country or we could expand in this form. I think we are working in locally with a development partner also to build a data on on and, you know related to the data itself, available data for management and decision. One is uh, we build a platform that allowing uh, stakeholders to you know come and discuss on on how to manage uh, the lake. And I think if you focus on data, it's something like this to be done. I think many initiatives have been done already, but I think a more inclusive and more active one, more or the meeting one is a uh, bit. This one we do, we take partner, Tanzania, government, the private sector, and I think many development partners in, in the platform to ensure to ensure that uh, we have uh, facility, we have uh, data based infrastructure, and uh, water environment analytical tool, you know, and data publication also available there and activity in terms of academic meeting conference is scheduled uh, by a timely and document with own interface. So that's what we do to ensure that uh, I think it could be expanded to the data. I think MOC have uh, been doing such kind of work but uh, to our experience I think uh, by what I said formerly uh, a more inclusive and more active, more coordinating role where and power is important, empowers uh, anybody, a body to ensure uh, the, the governance perspective of the data. I think uh, with that, I, I would conclude uh, my presentation and expect to have uh, an active discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ho, uh, for the presentation. Yes, uh, we will be having the further discussion during our uh, panel discussion. So I'm sure that the issues will be raised there as well. So uh, we will be moving on to our uh, next presenter. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please help me in welcoming uh, Dr. Davida Kamovich, who is the uh, Associate Dean uh, for 
academic affairs faculty of uh, political science school public administration and policy department in thammasat university bank of thailand uh, so over to you dr davida thank you very much neshma um, i have 15 um let, can can you please allow me to share uh, a slide as well yes thank you thank you um okay and don't mind me by the time <laughs> here um i'm actually lately i'm working perhaps to address the shortfall or because as longer time i spend in the i i call all of us here as a community or policy network of uh, people who care sometimes too much of a disaster risk reduction and then a lot of time we think that a lot of people would actually understand what we do and see the importance of the elements that we try to put into this uh, a lot and a lot more and we we talk a lot on these matters however today i would like to address uh, the other facet that i i believe that every country is trying hard to actually um, achieve in trying to mainstream and trying to make the world better or the safer community but i think it's it's time as well to address what exactly is the difficulties that is embedded and rooted in each of the society especially in the governance system that actually obstruct whatever we want to achieve we, we try to put a lot of gray green blue kind of measures we talk a lot about structural and non-structural measures trying to work on disaster risk reduction but we all know policy is actually somehow not easy to actually make the agenda up on the table and translate it into practice to the local area and make everyone is actually care on the same thing so um, today i think I'm, i'm going to address these difficulties um, before doing that um, let's uh, take a tour in thailand for a couple minutes before we get into what i'm trying to pinpoint um Thailand actually have confronted a lot of disaster lately. Uh, started out by my own research and my belief that the history of the real disaster risk management actually started in 2004 uh, in Thailand to be exactly put a lot of effort on multidisciplinary. And with that, this kind of knowledge education and we talk a lot about why didn't we have a warning system why didn't we know we learned about a tsunami and else and then we kind of interpret that way that it's to the risk knowledge and we're trying to put a lot of education toward that afterward which seem to be nice but no one puts attention into the management and governance side and also the policy side rather than putting a warning tower in in 2011 flood thailand has confronted with the problem that it is clear that it is political conflict as well as a mismanagement as well as the extreme weather that actually create not exactly directly hit five storms but then it's caused a lot of damage is rang on the top even more than the indian ocean so that's the intention move and the attention move to really actually agree on the argument that the management is also the important role in actually mismanage and make things even worse in malau earthquake even though we have directly death um one and two related but then it teach us that everything that we teach them socially about education in terms of earthquake and they actually have to try to save themselves that actually happened but then the knowledge of a local technical this is related to inequality and equity in thailand you're talking poor urban poor when you talk about this they are not going to afford for lot for like what the company the big company to help them actually renovate and retrofit houses which is more vulnerable than a big building in that area and by that chance it means that there is no chance for them to do retrofit in their houses so they need any other policy to actually help them do that. And PM 2.5 is even clearer that this is a merging kind of disaster risk that they never foresight before. And it is very complicated in terms of it because it is somehow related to what? Agricultural products, the forest fire, and it related to logistic, it related to transportation factory, and also it's related to haze problem regionally. So we are confronting with this kind of problem even more complex and difficult. I think this policy is not needed only directly to disaster risk policy. It's also industrial policy, commerce policy, international foreign affairs. 
COVID-19, yes, of course, everyone knows the same thing. Thailand has its own problem as well because this is a pandemic. And every country seems to pull back the national interest. It means that from now on, everyone would actually like to recover from the crisis that happened. So all the technical assistance, all of the cooperation and regionalization might actually be pulled back. So a country need to find a way to sustain itself as well. All the disaster in the past has teach us that we actually have to cooperate, we actually have to um, somehow melt down the border and we try to actually keep everyone with us. But the COVID-19 on the other way around just don't come to us yet and let us actually recover and sustain our self-sustaining kind of measures that actually on the other way around. And this is triggering me, even the more frequent disaster that happened in Thailand is actually seem difficult all of a sudden because a lot of data is out there and we don't know where the risk data would be. In a lot of developing countries, what is really difficult is the risk data platform. And I'm not talking about big data or data is very big. I'm not talking on that point. I'm talking in multidisciplinary, cross-sectoral, and also private government, public, and the community trying to share the information and make use of it as a decision making. This one is so difficult considering this. So by all means, I think I'm not sure that when we talk high, uh, global framework, uh, Sendai framework, us in a Admar, we are talking about SASOP, we are talking about the list, we are talking about ERAT, we are talking about Dana, Dala, and everything PT, P, PTSD, those kind of thing. I'm not sure we are on the right track that's speaking on the simple language. And I'm not sure we talk enough how we translate all of this framework and all of this methodological kind of solutions and translate simply to fit with the local area. I don't think we put a lot of effort on that very much in terms of this. And we quite not have time since the disruption is on a very high speed, the speed of light. So it is difficult. I think we require not understanding complex and compl how complicated it is. I think that it's time that we need to talk on transdisciplinary rather than interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. As a professor of the university, we kind of have a little bit of ego, even though we welcome interdisciplinary and another disciplinary. But to make a discipline argue on their own and then get to the fight, if we have to compromise one thing that the discipline, one discipline, single discipline is actually strong at, and then delay. For example, we used to believe that in evacuation, you don't use a vehicle that much. Have you ever actually go to some of the local area? You need vehicle. So basically, there is a sensitivity and element that you actually have to decide to fit as well. So I think this transdisciplinary kind of idea have to urge in academic and practitioner communities to find a way out. Collective action is not easy since in the local area, you have something else that is actually prioritized in their life. Poverty, education, um, how to actually make the uh, earn, earning the living how are you going to do that you have a sick people in the family how would you afford that so to talk to them the uh, risk is coming for sighting i think it's not very easy to compromise and to integrate risk reduction into their life and make them believe that to prioritize that if you reduce risk then the security that come would enhance the opportunity in economic development and to their status also talking governance um the governance in thailand is so complicated a lot of act a lot of laws a lot of regulations a lot of agencies as present to you in front of you on the left hand side is a structure that we go from the prime minister to the head of the village when things happen and the transfer of command and the practice by law regulations and plan which is very complicated no one actually pay attention on how to translate these marvelous outcome reducing death people who actually be impacted economic loss the disruption of the infrastructure and the increasing of financial technical help the risk data and warning Actually, no one is actually really pay attention on monitoring and evaluation to make that happen. Look at how many organizations are involving directly and else is more. So you have a lot of complicating things. To conclude my talk, let me spend the last um, chunk of time that I have over four minutes. Um, I think we have a lot to talk in terms of make things happen in the disaster risk governance. 
I perhaps cannot speak on the other countries in terms of that, but I have a lot of case study in, especially developing country, and even if in developed country in a very difficult cases. I think that we need what we call regulatory guillotine. That is a time that we have to revise and amend the disaster risk law and regulations. We kind of like chasing all the emerging disaster and disaster, which is in the area of cross-sectoral, cross-transnational, cross-functional thing. You can keep producing law to actually issue what to do. And that is time. Thailand need that, for example. And the strategic plan that Thailand has at the moment, it needs to be taken as a legal binding. Without this, you cannot integrate a complicated structure to work together to actually tear risk apart and then integrate risk reduction together. That's not going to be it because all of the agency would actually do what they ordered to do by their own law. So disaster is in the what intersection area. The incident command and those system that actually work single command and those kind of thing is not very professionally done in a lot of the system of the country because the trust is breaking between the central government and local government. Decentralization have not been there yet in some of the countries. And this disaster risk management and governance relying on decentralization with a capacity building, with our resources, with our professionality, and so going their technical assistant, there is no way if they're not getting serious in this one. They have to focus that especially um, the most three important, the last three one. You need to alter and simplify those disaster risk measure into the local way of life and priority. We have to understand that they, can, they don't have time to understand big words or even try to explain how long that would be that they can secure their life by risk reduction. I think we need to strategically design it into their life and make the disaster risk reduction reduce while they think that that's how they earn their love. I think those incentive scheme is really important. By all means, if you don't have risk data and if you don't have the big data and social safety nets design, um, these fallback kind of uh, soft pillow would not be there. And a lot of people in the society that are not equal yet need it. And by all means, we still need risk education and communication to actually build up the safety culture. With all of this to the recommending for me, on the progress of a lot of countries around the world, and also in Thailand, how serious that would be, if this can actually do the concert together uh, simultaneously, I think we have hope to actually build a society that is safer. Thank you very much. Back to you, Shana. Neshma. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tavida, uh, for being on time and for making such a brief and concrete presentation, which we will further discuss in our panel discussion. So, uh, I'd like to inform everyone that we've received apologies uh, from Professor Salimah Pak that due to some technical issues, uh, he will not be able to join today's session. We were very much looking forward to his uh, presentation as uh, and remarks today, but he will, uh, but he has sent his apologies for not being able to attend the session. So uh, sorry to everyone who were looking forward uh, to uh, like listening to him and uh, learning from him today. However, I'd like to uh, I'll uh, shortly request uh, Professor Hop to uh, send the presentation so that I can circulate to the audience here uh, present. So with that, uh, we will be heading uh, to our uh, second half of uh, today's session that would be the panel discussion. So first of all, I will uh, introduce all our panelists uh, one by one. Then we will be having their uh, brief presentation, uh, which will be catering uh, for speaker five minutes uh, maximum. Then we will be having a, a discussion further. So first up, uh, we have uh, Dr. Hui Li, who is the senior researcher and lecturer from the Central Institute uh, for uh, Natural Resources and Environmental Studies, Vietnam National University, BNU Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, so second, uh, we have uh, Dr. Zita Sebespari, who is the Deputy Director of United Nations University Institute for Environment and Human Security, UNUEHS Germany. She's also leading the UNUEHS Academic Section for the Environmental Vulnerability and Ecosystem Services. 
Uh, moving on, we have uh, Dr. Madhuri Masarkar Soyskut, who's the Economic Affairs Officer in the Disaster Risk Reduction at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, UNSCAP, uh, Bangkok, Thailand. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Indrajit Pal, the Associate Professor and Chair at DPMM AIT. So first of all, I do. Uh, we will be having a short, brief presentation from uh, all our panelists. So first, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Wei uh, for her uh, brief presentation. Over to you, Dr. Wei. Thank you. Um, hello, um, good afternoon, um, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, Dr. Wei. Okay, good. Okay, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to um, uh, present the case of the Red River Delta um, in this forum. So today I'm so pleased to talk to you about the Red River Delta risk and uh, resilience um, in Vietnam. So um, like uh, Dr. Andy Large just mentioned earlier, uh, I'm a part of the uh, Living Delta Hubs project. So um, the, I would like to give you the background about the um, Red River Delta. The Red River Delta represents 5% of Vietnam's land, but the people's set of population and 24 million people are living and working in the Red River Delta and the majority livelihoods in this um, Delta are rice cultivation with fisheries, aquaculture and forestry. Um, those people are located um, at the forefront of climate change uh, so that lives and their livelihoods are affected by seasonal uh, storms, uh, flooding, uh, drought and, and coastal erosion and saline intrusion. Um, the um, impact of floods in the Red River Delta have been observed uh, recently. Um, the um, uh, vulnerability, the people here are vulnerable to flood events, um, and um, especially agriculture and aquaculture are mostly affected. Um, more than uh, 500 households, you know, in, in the Red River Delta were lost due to tropical cyclone incidents between 1990 and 2008. Um, uh, Forty-three percent of agriculture in the Red River Delta, including rice uh, fields, were lost between 1990 and 2008, and fifty percent of the total rice paddies in the Delta were inundated due to storm in 1918. Uh, between um, 1976 and 2005, flooding and sunlight intrusion contaminated uh, more than 4,000 hectares of cultivated land and destroyed over 100,000 tons of flood in the Red River Delta. And in 2020, uh, by the time the uh, COVID-19 uh, um, uh, uh, was um, received, uh, the drought on intrusion damaged the cash crops and also found claims of hundreds of you know, households in the Delta and that caused a lot of um, damage you know, to the uh, local people during the time that they were facing with a lot of difficulties, for example, like uh, uh, the, the collapse of the market. Um, the um, uh, result of um, the analysis uh, of our data from the hub, you know, Living Delta's hub project, uh, demonstrated that um, the drought condition of the Red River Delta over the past uh, 50 years, you know, uh, just becomes more um, severe uh, in, you know, especially uh, during the time in 1961 and 1914. Um, and, and it seems like uh, the drought since the, um, you know, is significantly more extreme by the end of 21st century. Um, and drought events uh, have been increasing in the Red River Delta due to depletion of water resources, uh, increasing demand for water um, for daily life and as well as for agricultural production purposes. Um, our data, I know, from work, work um, in the 
Lin Dantas Hub project also showed that um, rapid changes in the allocation of private leaseholds in coastal areas in legalization or, and the legalization of private businesses have deprived many poor households of the livelihoods uh, that depended on the um, access to mangrove resources. Uh, the people in the living downtowns um, are also facing a combination of risk uh, exacerbated by lack of urban planning um, and also lack of sustainable uh, farming systems, a lack of capacity to manage uh, water resources, wetlands and mangroves. So as um, the uh, previous speaker talked about the case of Thailand in Vietnam, it's very hard you know, um, to mention um, disaster risk into the policy as well. So our job here in, in the Living Dentist Hub is how to translate the science into the policy. So in the Living Dentist Hub research, we try to provide a comprehensive understanding of risk um, in the vertebral dental to both you know, the local communities and then the policy makers and help them understand you know the um, uh, what they are facing and and what you know they can uh, um, uh, what adapt better to disasters you know in, in the Delta so uh, what we have been doing is that you know try to uh, promote you know the importance of local knowledge and and also use the policy dialogues um, uh, to get the message through and then uh, we have come up with initiatives you know at the community level uh, by working with the local government. Uh, so the community initiatives aim to increase resilience to disasters, uh, also prevent coastal erosion, shallow intrusion, uh, and also aim at sustainable flood and drought, and also managing um, using the and management uh, drought management using an integrated system approach. And some examples that have been, um, you know, uh, very uh, have been observed in the Red River Delta are mangrove forest uh, risk. Uh, restoration, uh, sustainable clam and shrimp farming, um, as you can see uh, uh, in, in the slide, uh, community-based ecotourism, uh, and also new rice variety resilient to flood and drought in, in the Red River Delta. So thank you very much. Back to you, Neshma. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ray, for being very brief. Uh, so now I'd like to uh, request Dr. Sebaswari. Over to you, Dr. Zita. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I am sharing my screen to you. Just give me a second. Um, yeah, so my um, uh, short intervention could be probably seen as kind of a follow up on uh, Dr. Tavida's presentation. Uh, because um, um, what we took up in our flagship re report, which we called Interconnected Disaster Risk, is basically this challenge which was raised by Dr. Tavida uh, too, that um, we do have this complexity. We need to deal with this complex complexity and we need to communicate this complexity at best in a way that it um, doesn't lead to um, a kind of a freezing and uh, people thinking that there's no way that we can tackle this, right? So um, the report that uh, what we produced is a science-based report, but written for the public. So it uses a different um, language, um, not a scientific language, uh, and it uses a, a different uh, visual uh, language as well. So we partnered with our um, institution with an uh, agency uh, specifically looking into uh, design uh, elements for such a, a product. Um, so we looked into 10 disastrous events from the years of 2020 to 21 um, and this is set out as a series of reports so we will um, um, launch a new report on September 22. And um, our hope is that our analysis will uh, encourage readers to um, view disastrous events in an interconnected way to understand that uh, systemic perspective, but do not talk about systemic perspective. We are uh, talking about interconnectivity, interconnectivity and we try to showcase what does it mean? What does it mean for me? Uh, what does it mean for um, anyone on the ground and also for uh, decision makers? 
Um, so one of the events we looked at was also um, related to uh, one of the deltas we are also working in. So we are also part of the Living Deltas uh, hub. And um, Cyclone Amphan uh, was one of the 10 events we looked at um, as it uh, intersected with the impacts of COVID-19. And um, um, that was one of our examples for um, so to say disasters which co-occur and mutually influence each other. Um, but uh, we also looked in uh, different kind of disasters, also uh, uh, disasters related to um, biological diversity, um, also um, uh, like the Beirut explosion, which has nothing to do with climate change. Uh, but many of the events we looked at had a climate change imprint, at least um, uh, in one way or the other. In terms of interconnectivity, we looked into interconnected root causes, um, so-called direct and indirect influences between the events and also interconnected impacts and cascading impacts. Just to um, highlight um, um, very few aspects um, uh, because of time uh, constraints. So um, in terms of direct impact, uh, we have um, many examples, but one I just showcase here is that uh, we had this extreme heat wave in the Arctic in, in 2020, uh, which uh, influenced the development of the cold wave uh, in Texas in the US. So this is uh, an example of two events uh, mutually influencing each other, but most of the influences uh, are, we are seeing are indirect. And um, here again, just to um, bring the Delta example, so looking in the site of Amphan, um, if you see the different arrows, which is interconnected with so the back arrow showing the increased financial vulnerability as a consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but also due to COVID-19, um, restricted movements um, uh, within the countries, within India and, and Bangladesh, which uh, uh, led to constraints in uh, income generation and uh, constraints in adaptation options. Um, but also if you look at the red arrow, so reduced effectiveness of disaster response, so that the fact that those two co-occurred, the cyclone and, and the pandemic, um, you, you see all these mutual impacts uh, in terms of healthcare, health facilities, but also going to um, cyclone shelters and, uh, and uh, um, seeing uh, uh, rising numbers of uh, COVID cases in the country. So we um, argue that uh, looking into these interconnected um, root causes, um, influences uh, between the events, was to help us to think better through uh, potential solutions which uh, might help us to address uh, more than one root causes at the same time. In the last report, we highlighted nature-based solutions and uh, adaptive social protection as potential integrated solutions which are able to tackle more than just one crisis, so to say. Um, but the next upcoming report will specifically focus on um, solutions. Um, so we are currently uh, working on it and um, hopefully also having some um, examples related to, to that as there. Um, so that, with that, I would like to close. If you would like to explore it, it's a um, fully emergible, explorable web website where you can browse the different um, events uh, we looked into, including root causes, uh, these influences and uh, um, joint impacts. And it uh, helps the reader to, to better understand that um, um, we are not an island and uh, our um, decisions, our choices have impacts globally. And those choices uh, impact not just us, but, um, but also distant places uh, at the globe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zita. Now moving on, uh, I'd like to request uh, Dr. Madhurima for her uh, remarks and presentation. Over to you, Dr. Madhurima. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen very quickly. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes, Dr. Thank you. Great. 
Um, so good afternoon, colleagues, and thank you, uh, AIT, for the invitation to this forum. Um, I have a few slides that I would like to share with you, and I really hope that this presentation um, complements a lot of what has been discussed, um, especially by Dr. Andy, Dr. Tavita, and Dr. Zita. Um, and, uh, you know, I will especially try and showcase just a little bit of our SCAP Risk and Resilience Portal, which I hope will speak to sort of some of the key issues uh, that Dr. Tavita as well as Dr. Zita have mentioned. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm, I will move to the next slide. So, um, you know, this slide, for example, shows that the deltas are one of the most vulnerable pop vulnerable areas in the Asia Pacific. Um, this is uh, from our, this is an analysis from our Asia Pacific disaster report, um, which really shows that both the GBM basin and the Mekong basin demonstrate an amalgamation of various risks, including poverty, inequality, as well as vulnerability to disasters. And uh, as Dr. Tavida said, the intersection of COVID-19 has really shown us that these overlaps of disasters and the intersections are not only occurring at a frequent pace, um, but with great detrimental impacts on populations and livelihoods. Um, and as you, uh, so for example, this slide um, here shows that almost 35% of people in the GBM basin are exposed to hotspots of hydrometeorological, economic, social, as well as biological hazards. And um, I think as Dr. Andy mentioned, climate change is set to exacerbate these impacts. And um, this is really reversing the SDG gains in the region. Um, and especially if you look at, for example, ESCAP's SDG progress report, it shows that all the regions in Asia Pacific, especially South Asia and Southeast Asia, are actually regressing on the goal of climate action. Um, so for this, ESCAP actually built a risk and resilience portal. Uh, so this slide, for example, shows the um, shows our hazard map for the risk and resilience portal. Now the hazard map actually it's a vulnerability map. Um, it really we are we really try to understand where populations are most vulnerable to the overlaps and cascades of disasters. So for example, this map shows where um, populations are most vulnerable to multiple hydrometeorological as well as biological hazards. So if you look at, at the map, um, you will see that the GBM basin in particular is highly vulnerable. Uh, and we have done this under climate change scenarios. So as you can see in the slide, um, we currently are using the RCP 4.5 and 8.5 climate change scenarios to understand the risk hotspots and the population and vulnerability hotspots. And we are um, working to actually update this to the socioeconomic, the latest IPCC 6 models under AR6 with the socio shared socioeconomic pathway models. So our, um, this risk and resilience portal uses not just hazard data, but, po but population data. And we are also using things like HDI, which is the human development index data to really locate populations under low development that are being exposed to these delta, uh, in these Delta areas. So as you can see, you know, India, Bangladesh, Nepal are highly, are going to be highly impacted. And having risk information like this, as Dr. Davido is uh, saying, having risk information like this that um, is, is, visual, is visual and you can actually look at the numbers um, can be useful to really prioritize establishing solutions um, such as early warning systems, for example, that and focus on where the most vulnerable populations are. So 
for the risk and resilience portal, we have used a vast array of um, available data that from climate science, disaster risk reduction, health, demographics, economics, and social data, and really use these to try and easily understand where populations, infrastructures, and livelihoods need the most support. And lastly, you know, noting these vulnerabilities um, in the risk and resilience portal, we have also developed um, an adaptation priority matrix for our countries. Uh, and as you can see, for example, India, Nepal, and Bangladesh all have high priorities for strengthening early warning systems and protecting mangroves. And if you look at the slide, you know, um, focusing on these priorities can really help accelerate the SDG implementation, um, especially for climate action on goal 13, which if you see from the slide is regressing in the region. And so these adaptation priorities can not only strengthen, of course, populations and population livelihoods, but also can be used to secure the achievement of SDGs. Um, so I will stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, and I look forward to the discussions on this. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Madhurima. So now uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Pal for his remarks and presentation. Over to you, Dr. Pal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nishma. Yeah, I'll not make any PowerPoint presentation because it's already too many presentations. So I thought like to highlight few few things in continuation to my initial uh, sort of discussion points. And also I, I want like maybe we need more space and time uh, for the participants to raise their sort of queries and questions to the, to the key speakers and the panel. Uh, so the, all are requested to put their questions in, in the chat box and also if required you can also switch on the mic uh, for the participants to open the question for them after the discussion a uh, few points from my side. We all know like the governance is generally refers to the action processes and tradition and the institution formal or informal by which collective decisions can be reached and implemented. Uh, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Tabida like implementation challenges uh, by the local government and the national government as well uh, for the various aspects of the DRR mainstreaming. And the majority of the countries which already adopted uh, Sendai framework in 2015 already to address the broader scope of hazards and risk. Uh, maybe now struggling to have like overlapping uh, sort of approach uh, by the climate change adaptations and also at the same time, the mitigational measures also directed from the DRR uh, sort of uh, fraternity. So this, this could be a challenging task for the different stakeholders. I think we all know that and uh, how to resolve that particular or make a bridge uh, between these uh, various stakeholders. That is a challenge like right now we uh, can uh, sort of sort it out. And uh, if we see the recent um, IPCC 6 assessment report, AR6, uh, came very very recently and the working group three report actually put together a policymakers uh, perspective like it explained uh, while we concern about the impacts of the climate change on the human systems impact on water scarcity food production and impact on the health and well-being and at the same time impact on the cities and settlement and infrastructure are also central in the resilience discourse so I think AIT as a research organization, uh, we are very much concerned and very much also into the uh, research uh, direction uh, how to address uh, various resilience aspect uh, for the critical infrastructure resilience for the, uh, for the coastal communities and how also we can make a better framework uh, and matrix for the, to, to resolve the governance issues and the challenges. So these are the few areas like uh, we are uh, fortunate to work with APN and also GCRF uh, UKRI project uh, through that LDH uh, Living Delta Hub uh, with um, various organizations. And uh, last week also, I, I think we all of us are aware about the Global Assessment Report 2022 also published by UNDRR, which is also emphasizing what uh, just now Adurima explained a little bit. And I think there are uh, more room and more explanation also given in that report, very recently published uh, by UNDRR. Uh, is also mentioned about the systemic risk. Like if we see the risk as a as a whole, then that should be the or maybe the 
a way we can uh, we should approach so it talks about like given a very nice example about like uh, systemic risk and its importance to the risk governance so it also highlights like traditional understanding of the risk can be linked to a uh, sort of view of the himalayan peak like it's a bird's eye view most of the time we can see the bird's eye view of the risk for for a uh, for, for a broader picture but maybe many of the times we miss uh, like the very detail and the complexity of the down below on, on the ground because of the obstacle of, of the cloud cover so that is a sort of analogy uh, made uh, in the drr uh, like global assessment report in 2020 i like that sort of analogy how, how we are missing some of the small bits and pieces uh, to address the risk uh, keeping in mind the broader picture where, where like some of the obstacles we need to address and also it talks about the significant and influential uh, sort of component um, uh, of the various uh, 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 sort of risk and resilience uh, sort of perspectives as well and cascading impact also one of the component which is also addressed in the systemic risk now the question is how and what method should be applied to to understand that uh, uh, that uh, possibility to understand the systemic risk um, dr tavida mentioned about the complexity of the implementation of the drr policy which is currently uh, disintegrated in the various uh, uh, national perspective i was also privileged to be involved in the implementation of the incident command system in indian uh, context uh, through various uh, sort of process including the de developing or drafting the incident command system customized for the indian uh, sort of uh, in indian administrative system um, so i can understand like what uh, the countries are facing the, the the challenges maybe at the the level bridging the gap between the science and policy so these are the few points i was thinking to highlight uh, to to maybe helpful for our discussion points um, so uh, my last point like how the systemic thinking is obvious and essential to create the future um, uh, sort of possibility in the 2030 agenda and how the how we should sort of go ahead uh, to achieve that because the time is less like it's about um, i mean almost um, uh, like half way through uh, from 2015 so so we still need to um, uh, sort of achieve 2030 through sdg and sfdr and obviously uh, sort of climate change policies so with that uh, i'd like to uh, close my discussion uh, point and uh, over to neshma and uh, if dr sanjay is here maybe we can also start yes dr sanjay so maybe over to you to chair the panel discussion take it further thank you Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pal. Now I think uh, with uh, Dr. Sanjay as joining back as well, so we will be heading to the main panel discussion and request to all the uh, 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 audience as well uh, to please post your questions in the chat box and who would you like uh, to address the question to as well. So over to you, uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjay. Thank you. uh thank you nasma uh, i uh, i i will request you if there are question in the chat box and uh, you help me to to flag up some of the, those questions in the chat box it will help me to drive the panel discussion uh no doctor but and um, yeah. questions have not been uh yeah any has been posted yet but i I'll, i'll keep uh, uh, you informed about it okay thank you i could have my i the few things which i thought it should be brought to uh, the discussion the panel discussion is uh, uh, the risk governance which came in a big way for uh, most of the uh, panel discussion and also our previous speakers so this govern governance uh, uh in 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 a, in a context like what we have seen in the region particularly in disaster multiple hazard context uh it requires lot of scientific input uh because you know most of the decisions are risk blind you say whether it is a big investment decisions or the decisions to 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 build huge infrastructure decisions to build social infrastructure hospitals roads 
many cases those are risk blind when it comes to the case of the delta where the complexity and uh, what you have seen the intersection of multiple risk is quite apparent in this case risk governance uh, has additional challenges and uh, this is where i see this uh, a living delta hub uh, can play a very very important role and uh, the discussion of today's meeting uh, will have lot of implications in, in, in days to come so taking that in back of mind i am uh, happy that we have very learned uh, panel members so if i take this to uh, professor chita Uh, with the vast experience of EU and EU, they have uh, been one of the lead agencies in the UN system on the, the systemic risk part of it, and also some part of the governance part of it. Uh, Professor Gita, my question to you is: When it comes to Delta, and you have seen the complexity of risk in Delta context, what could be some of your key takeaway messages? Risk governance. in a delta context and the knowledge gap uh, which this delta hub which take it for professor jeda thank you very much for the question um i strongly believe that this probably the question and the large um what in the um chat box so um i think we need to address these uh issues uh, on multiple scales so i very much um agree uh with david that in, on the uh, local scale we need a uh, uh, simplified and understandable uh, solutions uh, but then um uh, we need to um also integrate uh, the transboundary scale the entire business scale into our decision making um advice we are running into uh, man adaptive uh, decisions and um i was very pleased actually that the the new uh, ipcc working group truly um um provided so much insight into uh, new evidence on uh, man adaptation and um how we can uh, possibly um avoid it so bring it together the climate community and the disaster risk community and in my view also the biodiversity uh, community is key um however i think exactly this is a challenge that the more things um we bring together um the more complex um it gets and um this feeling of um what can we do it's too complex um really needs to be um broken down and and reached and uh um however at the end of the day i think we 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 uh, can't uh, um uh, entirely uh make this so um a simple that uh, that people feel comfortable so we need to uh learn to deal with this complexity at the, at the end of the day and i think this is a process where we need to involve everyone um we need to involve the public um the decision makers um we need to think about our educational system um when i am talking to my son they are not learning about sustainable development um uh, in the school also not in uh, so they 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 might need to reach a university degree until they hear, uh, hear about it so i think we need to 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 work uh, also um, on on education so that uh, we start actually by the existential questions um, and try to address them um of of course in a simplified way but uh, but from the very beginning uh, so that we actually try to build a different mindset thank you yeah. thank you professor jita uh, professor is it paul i think uh... there are some very important points that came from from professor jita and earlier panel members uh, this uh, in the delta living delta hub uh, the ait of course it's a, a unique research institute uh, mostly intergovernmental in in asia pacific regions uh, this can play a very important role and you have already taken a great initiative through asia pacific adaptation network and with many of the partners uh, i suggest that uh, uh, there are if there are few concrete uh, steps which 
uh, you could be able to focus particularly one could be on risk governance you heard many views on the risk governance because risk go- governance is uh, confronting with multiple layers of uncertainties uh, if you uh, you know it's like a <laughs> a elephant and blind um, and its story many people talk about on psychologies in different ways so uh, the request is if there are focus research on the uh, risk complexity in delta in a specific context to so <clears throat> living delta hubs in asia pacific maybe with sundarban with uh, mekong I think this will be a great contribution uh, from Mr. Paul from, from our side. Uh, if I come to Professor Lee, uh, with your experience of Mekong, uh, Mekong Delta, and Vietnam is, is, is the upfront in Mekong Delta for many of uh, uh, its real life experience as well as the experiences from research perspective, and how this uh, living Delta hub could be effective or to add a little more value in Mekong context. So over to you, uh, Professor Huli. Um, thank you very much for your very interesting question. Um, actually, uh, in Vietnam, we have done research already and we have um, carried out many uh, development projects. But the hub, you know, Living Dentals project just fill in the gap that are existing um, at the moment. One is that um, there is a big gap between the national government and the local government and local communities. And also the hub in our Living Dental project using the approach, um, we call it like a, the, the heritage approach that brings the natural scientists and social scientists all together. And then one of the principles here is that if we don't understand the past, we would not you know, be able to manage the future. So we try to work with the local community because according to the national government, the local communities are backward and they are lazy. But in fact, we try to learn from their local knowledge because they, they are the best, you know, they, they are in, in, the, in the forefront, like um, our Professor Andy Latch mentioned earlier, um, forefront, you know, in the Delta. So they know, you know, better than us how to deal with, you know, risk, how to deal with climate change and how to adapt better to climate change. So we have to learn from them all together. So um, in our work package four, we um, do the key informant interviews with the village head and also we do the, um, the focus group discussion with the women's union because of the women, in, you know, that in Vietnam, they are very important. They are called like uh, the domestic generals. And then we also, you know, uh, do a focus group discussion with the youth because you know that the young people, they are the agent of change. So all together, we learn from them. You can bring our knowledge and also key findings um, to, to, to present to the local government and through you know, policy dialogues because you know that in Vietnam, policy makers would not you know, uh, um, be happy if we say that we come here to teach you. But you know, through the policy dialogue and then we can bring the finding to them and then just you know, try to fill in the gap. And all of this would serve as the you know, input of the policy which in fact, you know, later on will benefit the local uh, communities. Uh, thank you. I hope that I have answered your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, Dr. Madhurima. My uh, query to you. Uh, take the example of uh, Cyclone M1, my our previous colleague also referred. Uh, you know, Cyclone M1 is one of the strongest cyclones in the last two, three decades in Bay of Bengal, 240 kilometers per hour speed. Uh, but the good part of it, uh, the mortality was, uh, of course, in the range of around 100. But what was the big lesson of Cyclone M1 was uh, the damage, the economic impact in Bengal of India is uh, uh, around $13 billion and in Bangladesh, $135 million. So, you know, uh, on the one hand, we are able to manage uh, the, the mortality, thanks to the advances in early warning systems. But on the other hand, its economic and social impact are, you know, the, 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 on the right, on the, on the roof. And this uh, economic impact of Cyclone M1, which is 13 billion, is mostly on the poor, vulnerable, the farmers, and uh, the small and marginal people 
on the coastline of the deltas of the sundarban what are uh, what is your take away particularly from the delta the living delta how perspective uh, what value it can pay add to protect uh, the coastal community the coastal infrastructure uh, with the living delta hub you also highlighted about the resilience portal how resilience portal can help uh, especially the knowledge gaps of the cascading risk through living delta hub initiative of the act over to you thank, thank you very much uh, dr shiva so um so I, i i think this is a very interesting and complex question um because you know when we look at cyclone ampan it happened in the middle of covid and so the challenges were not only for understanding um the impact of the disasters but also how covid intersected with with those disasters and the challenges for governments to um reduce uh you know reduce infection rate while doing response so i think it was a very challenging time for governments and obviously like you said um you know the economic cost uh it bore the brunt in the form of high economic costs um so i think the living delta delta hub is a great sort of example of bringing together um you know science policy for for action and um as you mentioned our risk and resilience portal actually has we're developing that knowledge under under the portal and understanding not just you know specific hazard risks but hazard risks from cascading disasters so for example if you look at our portal we actually um have uh, done a lot of work on various climate scenarios um especially for the delta region i think as uh, dr andy mentioned um you know climate change is happening now so we have developed um economic losses for example uh under various climate scenarios and i i think this could complement the living delta hub very well and provide sort of this knowledge and evidence base and take take it take in this to forward to the more you know countries and local communities and really bridge that gap um and i think it could be well complemented together thank you uh not to stress the um <coughs> sorry to interrupt so we have a few questions in the chat box yeah so uh, i think uh, if you yeah, agree yeah. uh thank you to read out the questions or Yeah. yeah you please uh, you pl- please take those questions forward Misha that's the priority here oh, so we have uh, the first question from professor Andy since he's in the panel itself so i think uh, professor Andy over to you <laughs> uh the first uh, the question uh you uh directed towards dr yeah. davida about how uh Yeah. Would you like to go ahead since you are well, already here? I was just very interested uh to read in your in your in your comment on the, in, in your lovely slide where you talked about on one side everything went up to the to the prime minister and but that the uh, mobile phone number wasn't there for everyone to phone at that disaster point um and then you know your cascade of who would actually intervene at various types of disaster um but there was one and then on the other side you had this thing about how we can simplify things in terms of risk reduction to fit with the local context i thought that was really interesting it's something that we we were looking at doing we don't sadly after covid and um, that break in our activity have the time to do the community science that we wanted to but it's it's hugely important but it also has a transboundary aspect to it for example in gbm it it is one ecosystem and the people on the Bangladesh side of the border are, are, are having the same life challenges and and operate in very very similar ways to the the uh, uh, populations on the India side and so we have to sort of try and really do much more of, of that at the same time as taking local cultural context in into account and so i just wanted if you wanted to just expand on that because i think it's really interesting and a, a real area where we can sort of find common ground 
to answer this question, I don't know how to make it short, but I try. Mm. Yeah. Um, um, since since I mentioned that the we we know that yeah. every we know that every actor has to actually have different roles. I think we all know that, and we also know that that each other sector, for example, academics or people scholars that do research. I can see the other question pop up: how we actually train that research, how the government, central government, is working, how international community, local and province. I, I think we all know we have different role, but the problem is. The disruption and the extreme weather is kind of at the speed of light at this moment. You cannot just slowly do it. That that that's what I think it's make it difficult. You need a, a speedy concert of all of the parties together. You cannot wait for one and the other. So it means that it has to be parallel work, back to start with. And when you say a parallel work, it means that each of the sector, each of the actor has to has a host of what's going on here. So to me, if I answer this. Then four different roles have actually been expanded. At first, I think to the local. That's why I emphasize on decentralization. But it's not in a political discourse or political science kind of discourse work. But what I mean is that we have to let the alteration of measure to be different from one place to the other. Some of the area scientists is there and trying to do a combination of the gray, green, um, and blue kind of measures. But then. This doesn't easily understand by the local, which mean that, for example, you said, but technically by scientific kind of information, you said it's a drought approaching, and you want the agriculture, the the farmers and else to actually stop growing rice or to actually make only once a year of production. But the problem is they still can see the level of water in that canal. You are not going to be able to talk to them in terms of doing this. That is nothing to be done in that way. So it means that the other government agency and other measure has to come in. For example, if you really want to communicate with them that they have to stop doing some farming and crop in some way, what kind of alternative that both from the research, let's learn whatever that we have, and the government of every level can provide a support on. Because if we want them to stop, even if we we can't, they can't see the risk in front of them. But if you want them to change to the other alternatives, you have to build an incentive scheme with that. I understand that local know best, and all the theory and lesson has been extracted from the local. But the problem is, the information that we have to communicate of risk is a different piece, and what different piece is not language wise. It's what they perceive. We, the local they don't perceive risk as of we perceive. It's 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 a two different things, and that that made it difficult. So I think that is a, it has to be very strategic, integrate, which mean that if you are going to, for example, I'm, I'm doing one of the research, I'm trying to have a local houses in up north in Thailand doing retrofitting. They can because okay. Money-wise, or financial-wise, they cannot do it. And an earthquake is not very frequent in Thailand. In order for for them to actually retrofit the houses, that that's less likely to happen. So right now, I'm I'm designing an integrative measures and waiting for the government to allow the sandbox of one of the province to happen. Which means that I institutionally I alter. The regulations of the city level, which by constitution they can do it. It's just that they don't trust the procedure that they can do it. Out of the law, and with that law, the province can actually use risk data in the houses that actually around the area of earthquake prone. And if they do a retrofit, we already have the design of houses in the way that you can retrofit with the budget of 15,000 to 25,000 baht. And with that amount of money, you need another two elements, which is you need a engineer, local engineers, which cannot be a kind of like a huge company, royal house kind of engineering. That would cost a lot. You don't build a house; you only retrofit it. So you need educated and well-trained local engineer, which all the university and engineering association of Thailand has already been training them in the local area. 
with the list of equipment and materials that you have to use listed by supporting by the Bureau of Civil Engineering of Thailand. With all of this come together, if the owner of the houses would like to do retrofit, the list of the materials are there. The local engineer has been trained to actually help doing that. And with all of this, if that 15,000 baht to 25,000 baht, if the owner of the house can use that amount of money to reduce the individual income tax, that perhaps can raise another 20% of the people who retrofit the house. And what I'm talking, it's, it's not far from thinking because right now Thailand has a shopping to reduce income tax to actually recover the economy in Thailand from COVID-19. If you spend 30,000 baht, you can use that bill to actually reduce individual income tax by going out and shopping. It's already there and implement for a couple of years to actually reboot economy. Why can't we do another thing for risk prone area as well? So the, the approach of doing it is there. It's just a gut to actually allow this to actually move on. And, and I'm saying this not with all of the segment. This is only directly to the somehow lower income segment. The higher income segment, you can go something else. You can go for building entrepreneurial um, contract kind of renewal fee that you can reduce it. You can go to other incentive scheme or even you give them another kind of corpse product, help them as a, a corpse so that they can actually grow um, on the on the field when they stop growing the plant that actually use a lot of water in drought. So basically I'm talking about this kind of um, of alteration measures that can use from one segment to the other. That kind of thing, I'm sorry, that is too long. Sorry. So, so that, that that's what I mean, but but we need a lot of I'm blaming myself in this part. A lot of academia and scholars, we've done a lot of action research, which is a good one to do. However, when we have less to learn, we usually have an excuse of, okay, it doesn't fit with governance system, it doesn't fit with culture, it doesn't fit with environment and all the context and content, so we cannot repeat the less to learn. I blame it to myself. Um, I think it might be the time to really extract what's the core knowledge that can repeat good lessons to somewhere else. So that's it. Sorry, I'm done. Um, um, yeah, Dr. Sanjay. Sorry, yeah. I don't know how long to give it to. Yeah, just a quick point, if you allow, uh, like add on to Dr. Tabitha. Uh, please, please, from <laughs> Yeah, like uh, recently, I, I mean, I agree with your point, Tavida. Like, uh, but I think at the same time, also reliability of the early warning system is also very much important uh, for the local government. So recently, I mean, uh, we uh, sort of witnessed, like, I was working with uh, uh, one of the organization here, like a regional integrated multi-hazard uh, early warning system for um, and for two countries, like uh, Cambodia and uh, Laos. To, to develop some sort of early warning uh, triggering system for drought. How we can sort of assess uh, with the uh, previous data and uh, to, to get into like like in another three months time, that would be a drought period. Like as, as you mentioned, like the, uh, we can warn them. But now the reliability is a big question, like whether the drought will be really there because the database uh, for the local government is, is I, mean, I mean, not much, you know, like, like the observation data uh, is very poor. Uh, in in some of the countries and then uh, because of that the reliability sometimes is not up to that level where we can really having too much of confidence on the uh, sort of the model we are we are explaining so just just to add on with your point like maybe we also need to see like how uh, like macro or micro or meso scale we need to sort of predict this uh, that one early warning for for different hazards thank you Uh, is there a is there any question in the Dr. chat? Sanjay, there are more questions in the chat box. Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. So I think there's a question from Professor Vadol for uh, Dr. Tavida regarding what are the good ways to translate our scientific research findings into local guidelines and materials. And the second question could be, uh, would you please elaborate more on the incentive scheme which was presented? 
Okay, Thank you. actually I, I picked that up a moment ago. That's why I, I included in my answer a little in terms of um, those uh, simplified, but, and I'm typing to answer that. I, I didn't know that I can have another chance. I protect myself to answer that. Um, I have I have two two ways to do that. It, it might find uh, ridiculous, but it is. Um, I think the scientists and not all scientists though, uh, the word that I just talk about in terms of the uh, earthquake that I talk, actually, I'm not the one who initiate that. In the engineering, a big top scientist, actually, Professor Pending at AIT actually walked to me one day and he said, you know what? We have a lot of parameter. We have a lot of structural measures that we can launch. We know everything about that already. The problem is we cannot talk to policy makers. We cannot talk to the local. We don't know how to put this as a policy driving in the local area. Can you help? us so that that that's one way you can do it uh, but that social scientists that work with you have to be the one that understand science a little bit too because you, you need that person to translate those things for the team and that that's transdisciplinary that I'm talking about in the first place that one way second way is this is pretty much at the local area Right now, a lot of scholars and researchers in the local university has also worked a lot in terms of action research to the community base. You can use them or right now at the local area, there is a local community and local policy communities over there by the community leaders. These people are really well educated at this moment. They, they seek for knowledge from internet, they seek the knowledge from webinar. And those are, those are the people It's actually, I, I, I went to several of the local dialogues and local conversations. A lot of people, even the elder, they are talking about, we know the gray measure and we know we have to balance it with the green and the blue. I, I didn't expect to hear this. And they said that, but we are waiting for someone to actually help us understand it in a trees, grass, um, dam, um, cement works. That, that, that's what they are waiting. They, they already open. They just need a person who knows science to come and, and confirm that what they understand is directly to the approach of theory. I think we might be able to explore these leaders of the community and, and that would help a lot too. So I suggest two ways that, that I learn about. <laughs> Thank you, Nimisha. Uh, yeah, Nimisha, over to you. There are other questions. Uh, I think this question will be very much pertinent and open uh, to the other panelists as well. So, before, uh, if anyone would like to address uh, this question, about, which is very much pertinent to our discussions for the whole forum in our consecutive uh, four events, including today, would be how we can translate the scientific research and finding into local guidelines and materials. Anyone from the panel who would like to address it? I don't know if we have got the answer, but it's a, it's, it's an imperative. Uh, so we were speaking in English here today, for example, and so we need to translate our, our words first into local dialects. Very important. If we talk about the SDGs, people don't understand what they are. If we talk about uh, ecosystem services, people understand that nature supports their livelihoods, but that's the extent of it. Um, if we try to break it down into um, provisioning, regulating, supporting services, we've lost them already. Um, so we need to simplify our language. We need to, we need to, I think, have much more dialogue with the the, the local leaders that uh, Tavita was just talking about. You know, so that we can begin to have those conversations. Um, one of the sort of techniques that we use in our hub is called Thai ban, which is um, it comes from a, 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 a word mean ban in as as, you, as many of you know means village in in, in, in Thai, and and it's 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 a immersive process where 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 the researchers basically spend time with the local communities so that the priorities come out um, from the local community, and 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 it's all about recognizing that as, as academics we've got two ears and one mouth and we should use them in that order sometimes and listen to people about their 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 life aspirations their their hopes and their fears um so that we can begin to really understand the priorities for the future 
um, and then how we can then begin to learn from them, how we can use their ad adaptive skills um, to help do that. But it, as part of that also then begin to help from our point of view, um, develop the next generation of, of leaders because, because generations go very quickly. You know, the human, human race, you know, our generations are probably now down to about 20 years. That's two decades and that'll certainly, so it'll be a, another generation before we get to 2050, put it that way, at, at least. And so we need to, as, um, um, as Zita said earlier, we need to get education going on sustainability, not sustainable development. The juxtaposition of those two terms has, has, has really created huge problems because our model of development of always going, going one step better, better, better has, has knackered the environment. Um, and we've got to realize that we have to talk about true sustainability and work out what that actually means in that sense. And I think we probably have to start that conversation with the youth because we've instilled in them in the last 20 years with uh, social media and, and, and 5G and all of these things. It's a recognition that of what the world has in certain places and the desire for things in general. And we need to sort of have that conversation about what, what is uh, necessary for um, sustainability going forward, on our, particularly on our deltas, which are which are low-lying landscapes at, at real risk of rapid change, and they have been changing rapidly for 50 years. It must be said too. Can I add to that just a little? Because I I actually see one of the comment from. Um, Vishal Narain, which is I really love that kind of thought that um, we need to listen to what the local people are saying and then translate into scientific discourse. You know why? Because as a social scientist, um, our theory and approach come from um, social phenomenon. So we never thought of that. We, we we never have theory and then explain behavior. We get those behavior and then we, we, we ground out theory. So if science in the other way around with the inductive that they usually have theory and tested it. And then if there is a switch that learn a lot more in terms of from the local language wise as well, and then constructed that as a very, a little bit more simple scientific discourse that is not only going to produce uh, a very friendly kind of knowledge, but it would also share out the local that they own the knowledge and they can actually be a scientist by daily use. That idea is really brilliant. I, 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 I share up to that. So, sorry, that, that's, that's it. I picked it up. I like it. Yes, um, I would like to add to that um, is that in, in here and, and, and for the Living Dentals Hub project, we um, uh, informed the uh, policy makers, you know, right from the beginning of, of, of the project. So that informed in our project and then they also informed in the process of collecting the data. And, and because they know how, you know, the researchers work in the field and how, you know, the, the data, you know, we, we deal with the data. And later on, when we brief them, you know, um, with the key findings, they understand that. And then they know that, you know, it comes from the local communities. Um, so I think that will make the process easier um, instead of waiting to the end and talk to them about the project and then they would refuse to listen to you. Because um, when you get them involved in the project from the beginning, they feel like they are the owner of the project as well. Um, so I think that that, that, that works uh, better. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this this is a very uh, complicated, difficult problem to to uh, improve the situation of the yeah, vulnerable Delta region. So. Yeah, um, <laughs> and to be honest, uh, I can not, uh, yeah, uh, add the 
another、um, new viewpoint for、uh, um, all your comments.、Uh, but but I, I, I only know the、um, situation of farmers in Japan. So based on the knowledge of Japanese cultural situation, the, yeah,、uh, <coughs> um, the local、uh, communities in rural a r e a is、uh, degrading、um, rapidly、uh, also in Japan.、Uh, the uh, uh, abandoned、uh, um, farm field. Is increasing rapidly.、Um, so, uh, yeah, uh,、um, the vulnerability of local community is、uh, not only in the developing country, but also in the developed country. Yes, so, yeah, <laughs> so I, I, I very,、uh, I'm very so uh, 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 afraid to,、uh, to the future of、uh, archery all the world.、Mm. This is only,、uh, my comment at that moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Toyama san.、Uh, is there anything, uh, Nesma? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Sanjay, I think、uh, this would be our, the last question、uh, we will be taking up、uh, from the、uh, audience itself.、Uh, so we have uh, from uh, Mr. Abibi. Uh, that、uh, GBM is a very active and dynamic delta, but current development activities and projects、uh, are having adverse impacts on the delta and in the urban ecosystem,、uh, like coal based power plants and others. So, how, as a delta hub and other initiatives, may contribute、uh, to this kind of human intervention? Yes,、uh, over to I think uh, uh, Professor Andy. I think I sort of tried to answer this in the chat with a long essay,、um, say, saying that、um, if Salim al Hook was here,、uh, he would have said, well, there were originally 12 plants planned and 11 were cancelled. So that's, you know, we've got a grasp at straws here sometimes, and the 12th was too far gone, and yes, it will cause damage.、Um, We have to, and there was also a question about negative oil spills. I, 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 I thought that that was the biggest problem with oil on deltas is plastic,、um, and, and how that sort of form of oil is a real, real issue. But then there are other problems. Everything brings oil. For example, in ecotourism, the boat will、uh, be a leaky thing that causes local issues.、Uh, we just have to try and deal with problems at a local level as we do. There was a question, I think. You know, not to dodge off that. I think, I think it's a difficult one.、Um, we tend to work more in the rural、um, environment than the urban.、Um, and and the, I think we just have to try and really try and address biodiversity loss to try and create,、uh, help the buffering capacity of environments to, to deal with these things. If we were on the Niger Delta, that's been destroyed by oil. You know,、um, the, the Sundaban still has the capacity, for example, to, to, to have buffering. Uh, we have to try and work with what we have and try and maximize that. And that again comes back to culture and recognizing the cultural connection of communities to those landscapes and the value of them、uh, and trying to work out a range of different vernacular and, and languages to actually、uh, emphasize the importance of what we have and, and the importance of, of expanding. And I, I think that came back to the comment Darlene put in just in the chat, which I was, I was going to just again type an essay to, but, but in, in essence, The problem with the SDGs are they're, they're an indivisible agenda. We, we can't drop one in the sense that we have to deal with all 17. And culture probably is an 18th one that isn't there that we probably need, but it's, you know, we, we have what we have. I think we need to just recognize that what's going on in, in our project and elsewhere is a growing agenda towards what we call localizing the SDGs. 
And I think that goes to the heart of everything that we've sort of talked about over the last five to ten minutes in terms of actually having conversations with people and finding different ways of actually you know, accessing individual and, and groups of SDGs and sort of seeing what are the trade-offs. We, we talk a lot about trade-offs of the SDG agenda and how it can get negative impacts and positive uh, synergies, etc. Uh, we need we need that conversation again on a local level with communities, community leaders, and and and, and the, the what would what the person themselves might think as being the least important cog in the machine to really see you know what is relevant to local people. And, and, and build from there. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Andy. Uh, I would like to just conclude with two points. Uh, one from Professor Andy on localizing SDG. Uh, I think this is one idea which brings uh, everybody on one plate, local, national, global, everything together. Uh, my second, localizing SDG in Delta context uh, and what role living data hub could be able to play in localizing SDG is brilliant idea to move forward. My second observation is uh, uh, Toyama-san. Uh, it's a great to hear about FN citation in IPCC, all three work with the report. It's a really great idea. Uh, one of the exciting part which our colleague spoke earlier was maladaptation. And the example of maladaptation is quite large in the case of the deltas. One example you just heard from the chat questions. So those maladaptation or adaptation, what we call soft adaptation, from, uh, from IPCC, uh, and if we could able to distill in Delta context, uh, what are the key research findings, like summary for policymakers we, we bring out in IPCC report at the end of it. Similarly, if there are summary for policymakers for Delta, especially to, to address the maladaptation issues, hard and soft adaptation and resilience track, it will be a great contribution from researchers from this uh, Delta hub to the practitioners who, uh, who deal with many different aspects of the data. So thank you with these words. Uh, I think this is from my side. If there are any points, Professor Paul, Nesma, uh, over to you. So I think uh, we have discussed a couple of interesting points. I think it will help us to also uh, sort of uh, uh, document few things, a uh, few points, uh, which can also initiate some of the uh, drive from the Delta I mean, uh, LDH uh, project, uh, which can initiate some of the activities to, to percolate down or, or communicate some of the inst inst instruction or information or recommendations to us the uh, policy group uh, in, a, in a more uh, simplified way. Uh, what we have uh, sort of learned from uh, various experts from various countries and organizations through this four uh, successful program. I can say maybe the last uh, point like uh, if any of the member can raise any of the any any last uh, sort of or, or final point from his or her side that will be also welcome and with that maybe Neshma you can conclude yeah. so any any member uh, any final yeah Madhurima you. Uh, I mean, the discussions were very, very interesting. Um, I, I, I think it's a really interesting issue of sort of, uh, you know, having the sort of ground up research that, you know, Dr. Tavida was talking about, but we also maybe need to remember that these are transboundary risks and therefore sort of some of the top down processes also need to, to be expanded upon and looked at. Um, so, for example, you know, I, I, I think um, for adaptation, especially, you know, the um, global adaptation report uh, that came out in 2019 talked about five key adaptation that have the most benefit um, globally. And I think it would be good to also have sort of that knowledge while, of course, discussing localizing um, of SDGs and things like that. But um, especially for something like transparent disasters, using that knowledge to, um, you know, create uh, uh, sub-regional mechanisms for for various hazards, I, I, I think that 
that piece also might be important. And um, I think we should we should pull together both sort of the top down and bottom up approaches for um, for understanding the risk and resilience of the Delta region. So thank you very much. That's that's what, uh, that was my last point. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, next one, I think it's time for you to go. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Madurima. Thank you so much, Dr. Mad. So uh, with that, I think we've come towards the end of the Delta Resilience and Risk Governance Expert Forum as a whole, as a series. So first of all, I'd like to uh, extend our heartfelt thanks to uh, the Living Delta's hub uh, for giving us this opportunity uh, that we could arrange uh, an expert forum as such where we see science and administration all together and address key issues consecutively highlighting three Delta hotspots uh, from India, uh, the Ganga Brahmaputra, Meghna Delta in India, Bangladesh uh, and Mekong and Red River in Vietnam uh, following to a regional perspective in South and Southeast Asia. And I'd also like to uh, extend our um, attitude to Asia Pacific uh, Network for Global Change Research for uh, partnering with us for the final forum and uh, making your presence uh, that we could get and exchange our learnings together uh, in this forum. Also, I'd like to uh, thank all our uh, respected speakers and panelists who joined today, uh, Professor Large, uh, Professor Tavita, Professor Zita, Professor Wei, uh, Dr. Madurima, uh, Mr. Toyama, uh, Dr. Shivasta, Dr. Pal, and for everybody coming together and uh, making this uh, event a success. And I'd also uh, not miss uh, at all thanking uh, to all our uh, panelists and speakers in our consecutive events in the last three events as well. Because of that, we could get a lot of insights and understandings and learning as a totality from the South and Southeast Asia perspective. And uh, to this also, I'd like to uh, thank uh, to <coughs> On behalf of the organizing committee, I'd like to express uh, gratitude to each and every participant who's been uh, with us the whole time since our uh, in, with all our events. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank all uh, each of the, and every participant uh, for joining us from all around the world for making time for us and being uh, with us here. Uh, we very much look forward to welcoming you in our future events and we will be uh, like circulating further information shortly and uh, today's recording will be made available in YouTube and circulated uh, via our Facebook page as well. So please uh, keep on check. With that, uh, with the permission from our chair and uh, Dr. Pal, uh, I, I Nishma Nader, would like to sign off from today's event. Uh, we will be uh, staying connected. We will be circulating further uh, information and events and uh, other as such via our email uh, via facebook as well as youtube so please stay connected with that uh, stay safe stay uh, healthy and thank you and see you very much thank you so much